some films, you see machines become so advanced that they end up taking over the world. Well, I'm here to reassure you and to let you know that this scenario absolutely will happen. <laughs> and here's how. In psychology, there's a thought experiment known as the ship of Theseus. This thought experiment asks you to imagine that this particular ship has been preserved. Now, what would happen if you replaced a single plank in the ship? Would it still be the same ship? What about multiple planks? What about if over time you replace every single plank in that ship? Would it still be the same ship? Now, this concept can be applied to almost anything. Take, for example, the sugar babes. <laughs> I must hasten to add, I have never listened to their music. <laughs> But the sugar babes, they were a British girl band that started with three members in the year 2000. And within a decade, every single one of those members had been replaced. In the end, Was it still the same band? Now, what happens if you apply this concept to people? At what point is a person no longer the same person? After a hand transplant? How about a heart transplant? A face transplant? Or even a poo transplant? <laughs> And what if you were to use non-human parts? At what point is a person no longer even human? What if you were to replace your voice with a computer like Stephen Hawking did? Or replace your arms and your legs with bionic limbs? Or what if you, taking it to an extreme, simply place your brain inside a robotic body? Would you still be human? I'm Robert Anderson, and ever since I can remember, I have left technology and therefore had made it my career. And the thing that I love most about technology is its potential to improve the everyday lives of people everywhere. And nowhere is there more potential for this than in transhumanism. Transhumanism is a concept where people are no longer confined to just biological bodies, but are enhanced through technology. It's where humans and machines start merging into a single being. Now, what would this look like? Well, for starters, we would have to get rid of some of our preconceived ideas of what a human looks like. When you ask any child to describe a person, what would they say? Well, they have two ears, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and so on and so on. This reminds me of a story about this guy. Let's call him Gary. Now, Gary and I were working together in an office, and one day we had a visitor come in. This visitor came up to Gary and said, Excuse me, do you know where the toilets are? Gary replied, they're through that door, and oh, by the way, you'll need my ID badge to get back through that door. So the visitor took the ID badge away, went away for a little bit, and then after a short while, came back again. And as he was returning the ID badge back to Gary, Gary, trying to be funny, said, I hope you washed your hands. Now, the visitor looked a bit flustered, mumbled something, and walked away. As soon as he was out of earshot, I went up to Gary and I said to him, you do realize he only has one arm. Gary looked over at the visitor, the color drained from his face, and he just said in a horrified voice, no. <laughs> in a transhuman world, we will no longer be able to assume that humans will have two arms and two legs. They might not have them at all. Or they might have them replaced with something a bit more exotic, say, replacing your legs with wheels or your hands with scissors. 
or it might be something a bit more subtle, where you have technology implanted inside you and have it merged with your body and brain. What would it be like when machines can help you to think and feel? There has always been a fear of the other, and this fear drives prejudices, division, and oppression. History is full of examples of one group of humans treating another group of humans terribly based simply upon differences in appearance, gender, ideologies, religious beliefs, or sexual orientation. There were the Africans who were enslaved simply because they looked different. During World War II, you had the Jews that were killed because of their religious beliefs. And sadly, in still some parts of the world today, women are still seen as lesser beings. Have you ever felt like you've been judged as inferior because of the way you looked, because of the way you dressed, because of the way you spoke? Now, worse yet, have you ever judged someone else as inferior because of the way they spoke or the way they dressed? What are some of the first things that come into your mind when you start a conversation with a call center agent with a foreign-sounding accent? You know next to nothing about this person, and yet you've already come up with some preconceived ideas of how this person will be able to help you based simply upon the way they've said hello. Now, I am going to let you in on a little secret here. I'm not originally from England. <laughs> I was born in Korea, but was abandoned by my birth parents shortly thereafter. And I would spend the next two and a half years living in various orphanages, and then, I was adopted into a conservative small town in Midwest America in the 1970s. I went from a population that was 99% Korean to one that was 99% Caucasian. Every day, people would remind me, in subtle and in not-so-subtle ways, that I was different. Imagine being an eight-year-old and having a stranger come up to you and say, go back to where you came from. You don't belong here. And this didn't happen just once, but almost on a daily basis. Whenever I'd go into a shop, shopkeepers would follow me around, thinking that I would steal from them. Even some of my friends would use terms like chink and gook, while I was around them. The message was clear. I was different, and therefore, I didn't belong. Now, take my experiences and multiply them a hundredfold. This is what you are looking at in a transhuman world, where humans might not look like humans anymore. And if you think this isn't something that we're going to have to worry about for a long time, it's actually happening right now. Here are just a few examples. In October 2018, scientists created what they called BrainNet. This was an interactive system that allowed three people to play a game together, using nothing but their thoughts. In March, 2019, scientists were able to inject into the eyes of mice nanoparticles that allowed them to see in the infrared spectrum. What this means is they could not only see visible light, but they could also see heat. And they said that this technology could easily be applied to humans. In April 2019, Researchers at the Institute for Molecular Manufacturing announced that within just a few decades, it will be possible to inject into humans nanorobots and have their brains connected in real time to a network. 
What this means is that your brain could be directly connected to the internet. With recent advances in artificial intelligence, genetics, and technology in general, we are going to see transhumanism become a reality within just a single generation. When I said at the beginning that machines were going to take over the world, I meant it. But these machines will be a part of you, and you will be a part of them. What will it be like in a world where rich people will be able to afford transhuman operations and poor people cannot? Well, rich people will become resented and envied by the poor people, and poor people, they will become second-class citizens in almost every way possible. This will further drive prejudices, division, and oppression on both sides. But a transhuman world does not have to be like this. There are steps we could be taking now in order to ensure that humans and transhumans can coexist peacefully in the same society. The first step is we need to legally define what it means to be a human. When you have been so enhanced by technology that it becomes impossible to tell where you end and the machines begin, would you want someone to tell you that you were less than human? This is a complex area with a, legal, a lot of legal ramifications, which is why it is important that we get the legislation right. And as, as we all know, when you play something that is this important into the hands of politicians, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Just look at Brexit. So legislators, they need to start engaging now with experts in order to put into place the right legal frameworks. And while legislation can change outward behavior, you still need to change the attitudes of society. The second step, therefore, is to identify the problems that transhumanism is trying to solve. There are the obvious examples of making the lame to walk and the blind to see. But when you have technology merged with the body and the brain, you could now have behavior modification without the need for drugs. People suffering with mental health issues could have their chemical imbalances corrected not through trial and error drugs, but through technology. Would-be rapists could have their aggressive tendencies kept in check through technology. People in general could have their learning abilities enhanced and experience instant learning. It'd be like in the film The Matrix, where Neo receives a download of data directly into his brain, and then suddenly says, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> there are some moral implications that need to be considered to prevent this ability from becoming abused. For example, we wouldn't want this to become equivalent to Harry Potter's love potion, where someone could make you fall madly in love with them just by hacking into your brain. But, if we get this right, we could reduce prison populations, do away with schools, and hospitals would only be required to handle births, deaths, accidents, and to perform transhuman operations. In this way, transhumans could become embraced by society instead of becoming the other that is feared. The final step is we need to identify a way to make this available to rich and poor alike. Some possible suggestions are introduce a tax on any transhuman operation and use the money for, to fund transhuman operations in poorer people. Or you could create a nationalized transhuman fund similar to how some countries have socialized health care. 
Or you could implement a benevolent system where richer countries and wealthy individuals voluntarily fund transhuman operations in poorer countries, similar to how some vaccination programs are funded today. Transhumanism is coming. We need to start preparing for it now. Any change of this magnitude takes about a generation before it gains traction. When West Germany in 1949 abolished the death penalty, over half the population was still in support of it. And yet, by the year 2000, just 51 years later, less than a quarter of the population still supported it. In the 1960s, you had the civil rights movements and the equal rights movements in the United States. And today, we at least like to believe that women and minorities are treated as equal across much of the Western world. In conclusion, transhumanism is coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. We cannot afford to have the fear of the other rule this world. I challenge you to ask yourself, how would you behave towards someone who is transhuman? Would you accept them? Would you reject them? Would you fear them? Andy Warhol said, they say that time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. Change is to begin with you. How are you going to be the agent of change so that you, your children, and your grandchildren can live freely in a transhuman world? where in the society of the future, a fear of the other is simply a thing of the past. Thank you.